This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Starting off the show is K-State Crop Performance Test Coordinator Jane Lingenfelser with details about corn, grain sorghum, soybeans, and sunflowers 2023 Crop Performance Test. She takes two parts to talk about the top two hybrids from many locations across Kansas. In the first segment, she discusses corn and grain sorghum and then wraps up talking about soybeans and sunflowers in the following segment. K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd finishes today's show with information about the two different broods of cicadas that will merge across multiple states, including Missouri, Oklahoma, and Iowa. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Thursday show discussing 2023 crop performance tests. And then to talk about them, we're joined by Jane Lingenfelser, K-State Crop Performance Test Coordinator. Jane, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Jane, as we're talking about these crop performance tests that really have happened for many, many years, as we look at this past year, what was the 2023 growing season like? Well, I always like to come up with some sort of analogy, and it really wasn't a roller coaster this year. It was more like a a water ride that is nice and calm and smooth before you just plunge down a waterfall into rapids and get banged around and soaked before the ride levels out again and is smooth again. So the majority of the 2023 season was relatively mild compared to the previous year, and they had hopes for good yields again. Eastern and central Kansas were still considered to be under threat on the U.S. drought monitor map, but there were some small and relatively frequent rains and cooler than normal temperatures that kept everything going. And early in the season, there were really beautiful dryland corn and soybean fields throughout the state. And surprisingly, there were areas of southwest Kansas that did get soaked this past season with periods of flash flood warnings. However, Uh, Most of the state did plunge down that waterfall at the end of July into August. There was absolutely no precipitation statewide from August 18th until the 24th, while the average temperatures were 6.6 degrees higher than normal. There were areas in the northwest and southwest Kansas that had extra soil moisture to pull from that were much better off, but central Kansas was really hard hit by the drought. However, in mid-August, the temperatures calmed again to an average average of one degrees cooler than normal, and precipitation picked up again. But for eastern and central Kansas that didn't have those soil water reserves to draw from, the damage was really done by then. There were reports of tissue damage and stock rots that led to yield reductions and lodging, which was not helped with severe weather later in the season. Jane, talking about a few different crops today, and the first one being corn, and what was it like for 2023? Well, first I'll mention um, the biotic pressures of 2023. Overall, these weren't really much of an issue, or it just wasn't apparent because of the greater effect of heat and drought. So the main concerns for corn were stock rots, and there were some concerns with Japanese beetles feeding on silks in eastern Kansas, and a few reports of spider mites, but not any more than usual. So looking at our results, I will mention the top two hybrids that performed well in a particular testing location, if that location was available. And this is by no means the only two hybrids that did well at a location. Overall, we found that early planted corn performed better this year. And thanks, as always, to Pioneer for supplying our maturity check hybrids. So starting out with northeast dryland regions, we had Manhattan in Riley County. The average yield at Manhattan was 141 bushels. That's down 42 bushels from 22. And the type 2 hybrids was our mid-maturity check from Pioneer, Pioneer P1289AM and Phillips PS0943V32 did well in northeast dryland. And what about some hybrids for the eastern dryland? We had Ottawa in Franklin County. The average at Ottawa was 174 bushels. That's down 10 bushels from last year. And hybrids that did well, Lewis 15DT664 and Pioneer P1170AM did well. 
Also, Rossville in Shawnee County, the average there was 185 bushels. That's up 34 bushels from last year. And we had two hybrids from Lewis, Lewis 13DT644 and Lewis 15DT664 did well in Rossville. Continuing the conversation now with irrigated land in the eastern part of the state. We had Silver Lake in Shawnee County. Our average there was 239 bushels. The two hybrids that did well, Lewis 14 DT 603 and our full season maturity check from Pioneer P1903 AM did well in our eastern irrigated test. We also had one location in the central part of the state. That was Belleville in Republic County. The average at Belleville was 169 bushels. And the two hybrids that did well, Pioneer P1170 AM and Lewis 15 DT664 did well in the central part of the state. We also had two irrigated locations. We had Scandia in Republic County. The average at Scandia was 193 bushels. That's about average from last year. And we had two NK varieties, NK1188 AA and NK1701V did well at Scandia. We also had Abilene in Dickinson County. The average there was 242 bushels. That's up about six bushels from last year. And we had two hybrids from Lewis again, Lewis 15 DT664 and Lewis 14 DT603. Wrapping up the corn performance test with dryland in southeast Kansas. We had Parsons in Labette County. The average there was 82 bushels. And the two hybrids that performed the best, Phillips PS0943 V32 and Lewis 13 DT644 did the best in southeast dryland test. We had no test from south central irrigated western dryland or Western Irrigated Kansas. Surprisingly, the only dryland site that was abandoned solely because of the drought this year was Hayes in Ellis County. The heat stress and the water stress were contributing factors in the loss of Hutchinson in South Central, in addition to adverse weather. But Colby in Northwest Kansas and Leody in Southwest Kansas were actually abnormally wet during July and August. However, both those sites were devastated by high winds and hail. Moving on to our next crop for today, grain sorghum. And Jane, what do we see for grain sorghum in 2023? Sorghum obviously is much more equipped to handle the hot, dry periods of the growing season, but we weren't able to recoup results from Belleville, Beloit, Assyria, and because of the differences among hybrids, were attributed more to the drought than to genetics. And there was some adverse weather late in the season, and we did lose the Colby Irrigated site to hail. The most prevalent disease for grain sorghum were stock rots. However, insects had a more negative impact on sorghum than the other crops because chinch bug populations overpowered many fields. So the chinch bugs combined with the heat and water stress caused many fields to be plowed under pretty early. Headworms and sugarcane aphids were present this year, but not significant enough to require treatment. Starting with northeast dryland, we had Manhattan in Riley County. The average at Manhattan was 96 bushels per acre. That's down about 10 bushels from last year. And the two sorghum hybrids that did well in Manhattan, Polanski 5629 and our medium maturity check from Pioneer, Pioneer 85P58 did well in northeast dryland, Kansas. Eastern dryland, that was Ottawa in Franklin County. The average at Ottawa was 127 bushels. That's actually up 20 bushels from last year. And the two hybrids that did well, Polanski 5719 and Dynagro M60GB88 did well in Ottawa. We also had a test in central Kansas. That was Hayes in Ellis County. The average at Hayes was 26 bushels. And the two hybrids that did well, Cropland CP64X1-23 and Cropland CP5921A did well in central Kansas. We had another dryland site in south central Kansas, Hutchinson in Reno County. The average there was 120 bushels. And the two hybrids that did well, Cropland CP68XC3-23 and Polanski 5522 did well. We had quite a few locations in our western dryland region. 
we had Garden City in Finney County. The average there was 39 bushels. And the hybrids that did well, Dynagro M59GB94 and Dynagro GX22923 did well. In Tribune in Greeley County, the average was 92 bushels per acre. That's up 17 bushels from last year. And two hybrids from Polanski, 5629 and 5522 did the best. Larned in Pawnee County, the average was 149 bushels. And our early maturity check from Pioneer, 84G62 did well. Also Polanski, 5629. Finishing out with Colby in Thomas County, the average there was 137 bushels. And the two hybrids that did well, RAGT AC2103, also Dynagro GX22923, did well in the western dryland region. We had three locations in our western irrigated region. We had Garden City in Finia County. The average there was 78 bushels. And the two hybrids that did well, Dynagro GX22932 and Cropland CP66X2C-23 did well in Garden City. We had a irrigated trial in Tribune. I will mention that it was very affected by iron chlorosis this year. So the average overall was 45 bushels. And the two hybrids that did the best, Polanski 5719 and Dynagro M60GB88, did well at Tribune. Finishing out, Hutchinson in Reno County, the average there was 157 bushels. And the two hybrids that did best, Cropland CP66X1-22 and CP68XC3-23, did best in the western irrigated region. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today but stick around because when we return we'll once again be joined by jane as we continue to talk about crop performance tests from 2023 You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Thursday show with K-State Crop Performance Test Coordinator Jane Lingenfelser as she continues discussing the crop performance test from 2023. Before we talk about soybeans and sunflowers today, Jane, in case they missed it, can you give us a quick recap of the 2023 growing season? Sure. The season started out relatively mildly, and I think producers around the state were cautiously optimistic that they were going to see some good yields after a pretty poor wheat harvest. And that extended into probably the end of July, where there was a period of about 10 days that were more warmer than normal, and there was absolutely no precipitation during that time. So crops took a kind of sharp nosedive and never quite recovered, even though the temperatures and the precipitation leveled out for the rest of the season. So started out well. There was a very brief, devastating period in between, and then finished out pretty mild. Jane, so far we've talked about corn and grain sorghum, so moving on to our next crop, soybeans. So the impressive heat in the second half of August occurred when most soybean fields had entered the flowering stage. So the lack of moisture combined with the hotter than normal temperature sped up the season so that the crop maturity moved along much faster than the overall plant growth. Uh, We experienced that in an average 22% reduction in yields in the group five maturity check varieties. Uh, I will mention one anomaly in 2023. We found that group three and group four maturing soybeans that were planted later than ideal did a little bit better. So compressing their growing season worked in their favor, but that will never usually happen. (laughs) The disease and insect pressures were mostly negligible. There were a few instances of soybean pod worms, Japanese beetles, and Dectes stem borers early in the season. The soybean gall midge was verified for the first time in Kansas, close to the Kansas-Nebraska border. So that situation will be closely monitored next season for this new invasive pest. Talking about the performance test for soybeans now, and starting off with dry land in northeast Kansas. The varieties are treated with conventional herbicides and are not separated by tech trait in our test. We'll start with the northeast dry land. We had Ashland Bottoms in Riley County. It was about 43 bushels per average. That's down about 14 bushels from last year. And our group three maturity check, Pioneer 
P31A73E did well, and also Kansas AES variety KS4323NS did well in Northeast Dryland. We also had Eastern Dryland test that was Ottawa in Franklin County. We separate Ottawa into group three and four and four and five. So group three and four test was 29 bushels per average. That's down about 20 bushels from last year. But the varieties that did well in the early crop test at Ottawa, Kansas AES K18-1396 and K18-6776GT did well in Ottawa. In our group four and five tests, uh, the average was 35 bushels. That's down about 16 bushels from last year. And the two varieties that did well, Kansas KS5120NS and Will Cross is an experimental. It's WXE8248NS did well in Ottawa. We also had Cairo in Shawnee County. The average there was 52 bushels. That's down 13 bushels from last year. And our Pioneer Group 3 check, P13A73E, and Will Cross WXE 8043NS did well at Cairo. We had a irrigated test in eastern Kansas, Silver Lake in Shawnee County. The average at Silver Lake was 75 bushels. That's up 12 bushels from last year. And the two varieties that did well, Kansas K18-1994 and our Pioneer Group 4 check, P40A23E, did well in the irrigated trial. We also had a dryland and irrigated trial in central part of the state. That was Belleville in Republic County. The average there was 45 bushels per acre. That's up five bushels from last year. And the two varieties that did well, NK Seeds, NK48-H3XFS, and Kansas KS4423N did well in the dryland test. In the irrigated test at Scandia in Republic County, the average was 46 bushels. That's down seven bushels from last year. Uh, we just really had one variety that did well. That was Pioneer P40A23E in the irrigated test. Finishing up, we had two locations in southeast Kansas. We had Pittsburgh in Crawford County. The average there was 49 bushels. That's up four bushels from last year. And the two varieties that did well, Kansas KS5120NS and NK Seeds NK49-C2XFS did well. In Parsons and Labette County, that was a double crop test. The average at Parsons was 33 bushels per average. And the two varieties that did well, Pioneer P40A23E. And Kansas K17 8 did well in Parsons. We were not able to recoup any results from our Western Irrigated Test this year. As we're talking about soybeans, wanting to mention some testing that can be done for soybean cyst nematodes. That's right. For soybean producers, please take advantage of free SCN testing by the Plant Pathology Diagnostic Lab as the ground begins to thaw this year. Samples can be sent to your local extension office or straight to the lab. For more information about soybean cyst nematode testing, please contact Judy O'Mara or the Plant Pathology Diagnostic Lab at 785-532-1383. And Jane, as we're from the Sunflower State, I'm wanting to mention how the sunflowers did in these performance tests as well. That's right. And they experienced significant heat stress along with all the other crops. Pest-wise, sunflower head moths are always the primary concern, but the infestation level didn't get to the, the level of requiring widespread treatment. There were a few reports of seed weevils and head clipping weevils this year, but those also didn't seem to require treatment. So we had three regions and three locations starting out in northeast Kansas, um, Manhattan, and Riley County. The average there was 1,440 pounds per acre. That's down about 500 pounds from last year. And the two hybrids that did well in this sunflower test, Pioneer P64ME01 and New Seed N. 4H422CL did well in northeast Kansas. In south central Kansas, we had a test at Hutchinson in Reno County. The average there was 1,826 pounds per acre. 
And the two hybrids that did well, Pioneer P64 ME01, again, and New Seed Hornet did well in Hutchinson. And finally, we had a trial at Parsons in Labette County in southeast Kansas. The average there was 875 pounds. And again, New Seed N4H 422CL and Pioneer P64 ME01 did well in southeast Kansas. And Jane, you've mentioned a few times that this is not all the things that were tested, just the select two hybrids from location. That's right. This is a very brief overview of all the hybrids and varieties that stood out uh, in the 2023 tests. The, again, the production factors this year were mostly weather-related stresses. So, as always, I encourage producers to look at a variety of sources and years of data to find the product that fits best with their conditions and management. Um, so the reports are available at agronomy, that's A-G-R-O-N-O-M-Y dot K-S-U dot E-D-U slash outreach and services slash crop performance tests. Um, the books are available at the KSRE bookstore and will, will be available in local extension offices or could be ordered by calling 785-532-5830 or ordered at the KSRE bookstore. That address is ksre.ksu.edu slash bookstore. And Jane, if people are wanting to find more information or keep up to date with crop production in Kansas, is there a way they can do that? Absolutely. They can always uh, follow along at our website. That address again is agronomy.ksu.edu slash outreach and services slash crop performance tests. And for additional insights into all things related to crop production in Kansas, please consider the 2024 K-State Crop Top webinar series starting on this Tuesday and every Tuesday from 12 to 1. Participants will be given a link to attend on Zoom or YouTube, and that can be found by visiting the K-State Northwest Research and Extension Center's website to register. That address is www.northwest.kstate.edu slash events slash crop talk series. Or you can contact your local KSRE Extension office or the Northwest Research and Extension Center office. And that phone number is 785-462-6281. Jane, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and talk us through a lot of the crop performance tests for 2023. Well, thanks as always for having me. That was K-State Crop Performance Test Coordinator Jane Lingenfelser. I will link the crop performance test in today's show notes on actday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. Cicadas are known for the haunting, screaming noise they make and for numbering in the millions. This year, two different groups or broods of cicadas will emerge across multiple states, including Missouri, Oklahoma, and Iowa. Brood 19 and Brood 13 are both set to emerge this spring, marking the first time this double emergence has occurred in 221 years. K-State horticultural entomologist Ray McCloyd has more on the life cycle of cicadas. We do have what we call the annual cicadas. They're called dog day or dog face cicadas. They're every year. People recognize them dull green, probably two to three inches in length. They're always present. Now, this periodical cicada, there's the 13-year cicada primarily in the south and the 17-year in the north. They look very different. They're smaller, red-orange eyes, more of a dark and blue body. And so you probably hear about, you know, certain times of the year we have these brood emergences. Well, there are two of them that should be coming up this year. One is brood 19 and one is brood 13. Now, brood 19 is a 13-year life cycle, and that'll be featured in a lot of the southern states, some of the Midwestern states. The closest states to Kansas will be Missouri and Oklahoma, although we don't know what locations those will be in. The other one is the 13-year cicada. That is a 17-year life cycle. And that'll be primarily in Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Michigan in those areas. So our brood that we have is brood four, and it will emerge in 2032. 
What these cicadas are, they look like large aphids. They have sucking mouth parts and wings. And if you've ever seen a dog face cicada, you know what it looks like. They don't really damage plants. They feed in the soil. They feed in the roots of large trees like oaks. And then they come out. You've probably seen the brown papery cases from the nymphs and the adults emerge from there. And then the females, what they'll do is they'll lay their eggs in these branches, at the tips of branches of oaks. Now, they have very sharp ovipositors, which are egg-laying devices. And the damage can actually cause tip dieback. And so when we know we're going to have an emergence, say, in 2032, we recommend don't plant any new trees because if the cicadas are laying their eggs, they can cause some massive, substantial, extensive dieback. And then the nymphs emerge from the eggs, and then they'll crawl back to the ground and be there for 13 or 17 years or, you know, for an annual life cycle, basically. So they're not really a plant pest, but... When you've got billions, and I mean, I, I have, I have been, and I have seen and been involved in two emergences since I've been in the Midwest, and it is, it is quite striking. You know, it'll, it'll freak people out, but again, they're not biting you; they're just flying around, and then they'll eventually dissipate, and then we'll have another brood, basically. So there's no need to be concerned, and just call your extension office if you have any questions. But again, we're in the 19 and 13 year broods. And the closest they'll be is Oklahoma, Missouri. I don't know where in Oklahoma, Missouri. I'm going to try to find out so I can go see them. Um, If you remember, I think it was 2015 in Topeka, we had our brood four and it was quite striking. I remember going into a Cracker Barrel restaurant and people were just running because these, these, I was there taking pictures. These cicadas were all over the place. So at this point, there's no brood emergence in Kansas. So there's no need to worry about that. But if you have any questions, you contact the extension office. One other thing we wanted to talk about is the fact that we're still in winter and we need to make sure that the plants are getting water. Exactly. This is the time of year, even though certain trees won't have leaves, there's still transpiration. We've had not as much moisture as we need, so make sure your your trees, your shrubs and plants, especially conifers, are getting plenty of water, deep soaking. And then also go through some of the deciduous trees and prune out the dead, dying, and and diseased branches. Get them kind of shaped up, and that'll alleviate pest problems. I mean, dead branches are places where disease can can probably get started and certain uh, insects might use, especially the wood-boring insects. But just get your plants pruned and, and mulched and watered so they'll have a really good start for the spring year. And if you have any questions, you can always contact your local extension office. Exactly. You contact the Department of Homology. You can contact your county extension office if you have any questions regarding insect or mite or, or any problems related to your plants, turf grass, or um, whether it be ornamental or vegetable in your garden. That's K-State horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd with information on the double emergence of cicadas this spring and the need to maintain the home landscape this winter. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.